Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, and thank you for coming to our 4 o'clock session. I don't know about the rest of you, but after the last two days that Vic, what Victor has put on for us, I feel like I have a, an advanced degree in mixed reality uh, from this conference. It's been quite good. Uh, we're going to try to talk about something different, you know, which is a little hard when there have been 10 previous conversations on the subject. Uh, our focus uh, in this session is really on storytelling, and I have a really wonderful uh, group of people here, panelists, who are going to tell you about what their experiences have been. Uh, I think we'll just start out first uh, with introductions. My name is Ariella Lehrer. I'm the president of Hitpoint Studios. Uh, we work primarily in AR. And why don't we just go down the uh, row here? Uh, I think introductions related to the topic, you know, when, because you all have such massive backgrounds that this way you can, you know, focus it on uh, mixed reality. Sure. But go right ahead. All right. Uh, my name is Patrick Aloise. I head up. Um, digital and AR for Movieville. Uh, we're actually a new connected print uh, collectible movie magazine and augmented reality platform. And so we are partnered with Regal Cinemas. Um, so when you go to the movies, you will have a basically a companion that goes along with the movie. So similar if you went to go see Hamilton on Broadway, you, you would hand your ticket over and you would get your Hamilton playbill. When you go see a movie on opening weekend, so if you went and saw Infinity War, if you go see Jurassic World at a Regal, um, then uh, on opening weekend, then you will hand your ticket over, you'll get your movie bill. Yeah, each page is interactive. Uh, we're embedded in the Regal app, uh, so you can open the uh, uh, movie bill AR camera, uh, which is on the home page, um, and then each page does something unique. Uh, 3D AR. Um, digital page replays, Harry, Harry Potter style uh, kind of pages, that kind of thing. Cool, hi, BC Bierman, uh, founder of the Heavy Projects, uh, associate professor of emerging media at Cavett and, and civic media fellow at USC uh, Annenberg. I think probably what mostly connects my work to, to this conference is uh, about a decade ago, we <coughs> um, as activists, artists, and as academics, we're interested in activating public spaces using augmented reality. Uh, we conceived a, of a way to use uh, advertising, billboards, street level ads in, in New York uh, to overlay curated street art. Um, that kind of took off and we started activating public spaces on a much larger scale, uh, creating large scale street art murals that were activated in augmented reality. Uh, hi, I'm Kimber Lim. Um, Thanks for staying so late today. <laughs> it's probably the last panel for you guys. Um, my background is uh, have been in uh, interactive media, gaming, uh, live action production, primarily um, in visual effects is where I spent most of my career. I deep dive into uh, VR, um, producing the first um, scripted live action with actors and uh, experience for Milk VR before it became Samsung VR back a few years ago. Um, uh, I'm currently consulting for uh, entertainment and uh, and brand companies like Netflix and Monster Energy, um, also uh, advising a social VR platform um, called MetaTable Poker um, and uh, helping them with uh, investments and also uh, partnerships. Hi, I'm Mike Manello. I'm a founder and creative director of Campfire, which is a marketing agency embedded in the mill. So we're part of the Technicolor family. Um, we work closely with the emerging tech team there. Um, we work primarily with entertainment companies, and uh, we don't do traditional marketing. We tend we extend the stories into non-traditional spaces. Uh, we work a lot with HBO, uh, launching True Blood, Game of Thrones. Most recently, we did the season one and season two activations for Westworld. So we're uh, telling stories in non-traditional spaces everywhere. Hi, my name is Christopher Belasi. Up until very recently, I was the head of business development for, for Proof, which is a visualization company whose primary pursuit was uh, pre-vis, post-vis, tech-vis for big feature films, uh, probably best known for the Fast and Furious franchise. Uh, there are most recently, they, we've been doing work in the VR space using our visualization skills to help our primary VR client, which was Here Be Dragons, do some of the kind of higher end, high production value 
cinematic experiences like the 24 Legacy piece, uh, the Santa Sleigh Ride piece that was a pop-up at the Grove a couple years ago. Um, in fact, we, we worked on the very first Google Spotlight story, uh, and still to this day the only Google Spotlight story that's a live action piece because of our relationship with Justin Lin having done um, four films with him. My background is motion capture. My first gig was a little mocap artist on a, a little indie film that Jim Cameron directed called Titanic. <laughs> Never heard of it. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Kaylin Ray. I'm the uh, development supervisor at Magnopus, where I see up all of the prototyping that we do and get started on. I, I lead the storytelling teams and engineering and art so that we can uh, get started on the right foot. A couple of the things that we did last year were uh, the CNN VR experience, which is on Oculus, also Blade Runner 2049, the Memory Lab, which is a marketing tie-in for the film, and also Coco VR, which was also a marketing tie-in for that film. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Victory Creative Studios, which is a uh, where we help to create meaningful positions for women and women of color in the film business. Great. So now you know what I mean about my panelists. Um, so uh, this is off. I didn't give you this question ahead of time. <laughs> but I, uh, coming from the gaming business, you know, when, when somebody wants to get into uh, the games business, we always say, well, start in QA. You know, that's you'll learn about the structure of games. You'll learn about how games are designed. You'll learn about engineering. Start in quality assurance. So how, I'm fascinated after listening to your descriptions about where you all came from. And some of you talked about it a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. you came from motion capture. I think you came from uh, special effects, right? I mean, where do, if, if you're sitting in this audience and you're interested in jumping into virtual reality or AR, where do you come, where do people come from? I have, I have a practical answer for that. Okay. Uh, Craigslist. <laughs> I, got, I got started in this business about 10 years ago. I didn't know anybody, um, so I, I got on Craigslist. And um, I, I had experience as a plumber's assistant. And the very first job I got, the AD told me he hired me as a PA because I had blue collar work experience. And uh, ever since then, I, I've, I've just sort of fallen into everything by just saying yes. And I, I worked in Previs for a number of years, and that was the greatest thing because at the time everybody was like, nobody wants to do Previs. Nobody wants to do Previs. <laughs> and I thought, you're dumb because Previs artists get to talk to the director and the producer every single day, all day, so I'm gonna do that. <laughs> so. Anyone else have a, a yeah, story I think, to share? I, I, I think <clears throat> that you know, gaming and visual effects is, and, and Previs, and the reason for that, kind of jumping into this uh, type of uh, an environment in AR and VR is you're thinking in 3D space all the time. You're thinking in 360 degree space all the time. So uh, being able to you know, really understand uh, that world and being able to vision what that is and being able to direct uh, where people are going to look um, and being able to have that continuity um, across um, really helps <laughs> to develop you know, content and product. And well, I think a lot of it's just entirely dependent on you know what what are your what's your skill set, right? I mean, yeah. if you're a CG artist, that's kind of an obvious walk over. If you're a storyteller, that's kind of an obvious thing. If you know if you don't if you're in the business of it, you know I would say expose yourself to as many experiences as, as you can, as many conferences as you can. I mean, you know nobody's it, it, this guy aside, nobody's a real <laughs> expert in VR. I mean, it, there's the Andy Cochran's of the world if you know who he is. They're they're out there, but most of us learn by doing and by attending these these conferences. I, I mean, I listen. The first time I put on a VR headset was in the mid '90s. It was that crazy 10 pound counterbalanced headset <laughs> with the two SGI Onyx two reality engines one for a million dollars a piece one for each eye to render it it was a nausea machine but I <laughs> I saw that I saw the allure back then and obviously now uh, the 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 barrier entry has become significantly lower but clearly not low enough so I would just say expose yourself to as, as many immersive experiences whether it be VR AR location based whatever as you can uh, and and I think that will drive how you want to engage with the medium. That's a 
that's a really I'd like to just add to that only because because the space in that is now so vast and uh, and entry points are so wide um, it doesn't have to be just technical or you know whatever you've done in the past um, you could be you know you could you could be an education or you could be a writer or you can be, you know, so so there's a lot of ways to kind of enter into the market you know, I'm a big believer in you make your own opportunities, so I've always been an entrepreneur. I started as an indie filmmaker, um, and with uh, four other guys in Orlando, we made the Blair Witch Project, and uh, out of that, I really was much more interested in the storytelling we were doing online than in the process of making the movie, and I wanted to do more of it, and uh, Campfire was actually started as a result because uh, Hollywood still wasn't prepared to invest any money online, but advertising was. And so Campfire actually was just formed purely because I wanted to chase after that opportunity. I thought uh, there's so much more opportunity to tell stories in so many new ways. And, and, uh, and since then, it's all, I've been an entrepreneur just chasing after the things I want to do. Okay. Do you want to yeah, just, just briefly, and uh, I came not so much with a a skill set approach is, is was an ideological approach. Um, I'd been researching graffiti and billboards in Los Angeles and sort of the disconnect between the two, how they treat it legally. Um, augmented reality was a way for us to um, engage and allow artists and citizens to engage in public spaces in ways they couldn't before because they had access now to, to and this is 10 years ago, they had access to, to mobile devices. Uh, so. The, for us, the technology really sit on, sat on top of an idea, and that idea sort of still carries us through today. Now the hardware is lagging behind a little bit. It's gonna, it's moving to wearables as opposed to this the clunky experience of a mobile device. And maybe we can talk about UX issues a little bit later. But that's sort of how we came into the the air of space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, since this is a panel on storytelling, let's start with stories that you've told. And I think having spoken to some of you individually, um, there's, some, there's some pretty good stories there about what has worked and what hasn't worked in either AR or VR. So thinking of a narrative, um, somebody want to start? Stories you've told, the successes and the failures. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of jump in, um, doing a lot of thinking of this as we just launched this magazine because it really is kind of big talking about a film story that you're having and, and how do you ex have a kind of a, an organic extension from that you can kind of take home with you. And so um, I think we've been successful with this so far that the data is kind of proven that people do engage very heavily with it. Um, and I think that's in part because when you go to the movies, and again, this is just, I think, storytelling in general is you need to evoke emotion. There has to be beginning, middle, and an end. Uh, uh, and, and it has to be something that people can relate to. And so we had, the, in, in, you know, with our inaugural issue, we had the, the luxury of having some really high-end IP and some, some beautiful artwork that was, you know, that the studio had created. Um, and so it was, it was kind of fun just to really continue to tell the, the same story here, but tell it in the kind of the 360 space. So this is the person sitting in the uh, movie theater with a essentially magazine on their lap, mm -hmm. and with using their phone and augmented reality, you're extending the story that they have seen or are about to see on. You're right. And, and so issues of retention with that. That's, well, you know that's that. always the bugaboo, right, with AR. How many times are you going to go back to it? How long are you going to keep the, the user engaged? Yeah, and that, and I think that is, uh, I mean, again, we, I think, we're really smart up in a, set it up in a smart way where we're tracking all the data on the back end. And so we do see, I mean, you see that natural life cycle that you're going to see with anything. It's going to, you know, you have this big spike and much, it, it probably would follow the same pattern as the film. Um, but what we are seeing is that this isn't something that people are interacting with in the theater and then leaving behind. Um, and if you guys want to see, it, I'll show it to you. But it's it's you know it's meant to be a collectible. It's meant to go home with you. It's, you know, uh, I, I'll age myself by saying, you know, if if they had these when Rocky Four came out, I would probably still have one in my garage somewhere. So so the idea is to allow people to kind of go into the world of the movie to kind of unlock the hero of the movie and interact with them in some way. Um, and, and I think that's really kind of the main, from a storytelling point of view, I think that's, that's what people want. Um, and we see that people are sustaining it. And I think it's probably a little bit of like, hey, check this out, because we are seeing you through the week that we are still having, you know, six-figure engagements 
so it is sustaining itself. It, you know, again, like anything, um, we'll have another issue that's going to come out, you know, and that'll be about Jurassic World. And so uh, maybe the same audience, maybe a slightly different audience, but, but nonetheless, it is person that's going to the movies on opening weekend and so you're giving them content that they want at that time and so I think it's it's easy to tell them that story because you're giving them what they want when they want it too. Right. So. On the visualization side you know we don't tell our own stories people come to us and we help them figure out their stories but what we realized very early on is that um, what you see on paper may not necessarily work in the headset and so what I, what especially on these higher end projects you know it's you can have stuff I've seen it you know people have different approaches to writing stories for VR it's, it's you know some are traditional scripts some are a game design document some are hybrids of the two I think everybody's kind of feeling their way as to what works best I, I haven't settled on anything that I think is ideal they all have their, their their pluses and minuses but what we found was an easy way to figure things out was to rapidly prototype what you would see in pre-visit in a, in a headset and because it, it can a lot of times we would look at something and be like that's gonna be awesome and you put it in the headset real quickly and you go that's terrible and yeah. and and one of the things that we help our clients figure out is a you know simple things like you know is this are you gonna is this gonna make you sick or not because if the previous is gonna make you sick the real thing is gonna make you sick but more than that is it is is the branching narrative gonna work if you, if you choose door a or door B and even more than that, what we found on, on one of the projects we worked on, unfortunately, I can't get too in, into it because it was NDA and it got killed. But what we noticed was originally it wasn't, we just were helping them figure out how to make it fun. You know, as constructed on the paper, it looked like it would be fun. Initially, as constructed in the headset, was not fun at all. But we learned very rapidly, okay, this is what will make it work and this is what will make it fun. So the, it's, I guess iteration is the key to good storytelling in the immersive realm because you can quickly figure out what will and won't work. I would definitely agree with that, yes. 100%. Yeah, it, when we were working on Coco VR in the very early stages, we had a lot of really, you know, quote unquote, great ideas. And uh, right, as soon as we got them in the headset, we were like, our ideas are not great. And uh, so we knew we were going to create this social back end for it. We knew it was going to be a social experience from the very beginning. And as soon as we got the social, the networking part of it ready to go, and you could go in there and you could see yourself as a skeleton, the story kind of wrote itself and, and the experience created itself. You get yourself in another room, in, in a room with another person, and you are both skeletons and you just have a mirror in front of you. <laughs> you're both gonna you're gonna create a show that anybody would want to watch it's just it it's so delightfully uncanny <laughs> that that you just kind of want to be in there seeing yourself moving and dancing around in this magical fantastical space that uh really i think in these early stages of vr we're just uh creating sandboxes and having as much fun as we can possibly have within that context and and it, it, it's my perspective uh having that be social you're going to gain you know 90 percent of the work is going to be done for you i mean it's the hardest amount of work so can you just follow that up with a story you told me about from coco about directing people's attention i thought that was beginning at the at the very interesting at the very beginning yeah well yeah so <laughs> I don't know if we. I don't know if I should call it a problem, but you know, there it is. I use that word. Um, a, a lot of storytelling. You know, when you get back to the basics of of people telling a story around a campfire, uh, you know, a good story is a good story. It doesn't matter what the medium is, but VR is a very specific medium, and some of the things that we use from the current popular storytelling format, which could be film. Uh, a lot of those visual audio skills transfer over into VR one-to-one, -one, no doubt about it. But there's one very critical thing that doesn't transfer at all, which is uh, the, the frame, essentially, the, the composition. Uh, you know, that's what we did in Previs. We would guide what the user is going to be looking at. The director says, I want the, I want the audience to look at this person's fingernail because there's like a, you know, a blood clot on the fingernail. You can't do that in VR. You can't force the user to go here to look at this thing and to feel a certain way about it. Or at least 
if there is, we don't know what that is yet because it's it, you're not sitting there with this passive experience with with the, a screen in front of you that's been curated in terms of the visual impact that that the director wants wants you to have. You've got this sort of theater in the round scenario that's inverted now because instead of the audience being around looking in at the play, the audience is the play looking out at the world. And that's a, that's a really odd sort of concept for storytelling. I, I'd like to jump in. Yes. Um, so how many of you guys are actual content creators and storytellers and writers? Okay, so a majority of you. Um, I, I think that uh, you know, in terms of the type of storytelling that is 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 happening uh, in in VR particularly, um, the things that I've learned in the past is you know I started at Haller creating a lot of 360 videos and we did a lot of experimenting in in what would retain people's attention, how long are they going to watch this stuff, um, and everyone is it knows that you know at least for live action you really need to kind of go where you can pull the heartstrings and tell stories that um, can be empathetic and emotional. We all know that now. Um, and and you know in terms of in terms of just really using this medium to its its complete advantages um, in animation and taking you to a new place in a new world and being able to create characters that can tell you know, a, a story and, and you can interact with them, it takes this, this medium to a whole other level. Um, the, real, the real piece that still is uh, a variable is how do you tell a live action story in VR? Um, what do you need to do? Uh, how is that effective? Uh, um, we've had several you know, series now that have come out um, that is still m hasn't made the impact that it should. And I think these are the things that we should question ourselves and trying to figure out, like, what does that mean? I think that, um, you know, generally speaking, the things that's going to, uh, you're going to be able to take advantage of is thinking of it as two different things. One is, if you're creating a story or writing a story or m wanting to make something, it's all about the world that you're creating. Right? Whether, whether you do that visually live action or whether you do that in animation, but because this medium is so, uh, because you can't direct them and you can't uh, really say like what it's going to do is you're now creating a, a, a whole world, your world building. Um, you can't really think of it as linear storytelling because it doesn't quite work. There are ways to make it a little bit more successful. Um, I really enjoyed, you know, one of the, I forget the name of it, but it was an animated piece. Uh, you sit in a chair, and it guides you to where they want you to look. And <laughs> I found that fine. You know, that was fine. Uh, it took a lot of the work out, and it was being able to still feel like you're completely immersed in this place, but um, it still directs you. And you can do that. You can use different tricks to, <coughs> to tell stories in this, in this environment. But... Um, but ultimately, um, it's it's world building, and then and then it is um, you know using using the technology to your advantage, um, um, and thinking of it as you're you're not just, just telling a story. And I'm gonna uh, quote Celine on this, uh, who is a who is a uh, VR director. Um, you're creating memories. This is a whole different way of reaching people's consciousness and subconsciousness and being able to, because it's not just, you're not just telling a story, you're creating people's experiences and creating memories. And so how do you do that? What is, what is the thing that you're interested in? How do you incorporate those in, as a focus in being able to tell the story that you want to tell and using this medium to, to and taking full advantage of that? Well, yeah, so um, I think as a storyteller, the secret to figuring out how to tell stories in new mediums uh, this and this is when you're writing the story, not when you're making it, is not to think about all the incredible things you can do, is to think about all the things you can't do and start to develop a story that goes around that because you're not going to solve those issues with technology, right? And, I'm, and I mean, this principle is the same principle that we used for Blair Witch, which was 
We have no money. We have no access to name actors. We have no lights that we can bring out into the woods. What kind of you know? No access to lighting. No great cameras. We can afford a high eight camera that we'll get from Best Buy in return. How, what kind of movie can we make with that, <laughs> right? And turn all the negatives of not having money into an extraordinary positive. And I think when you think about VR and where it is right now, and you think about, and I think we do a disservice when we call VR immersive, because immersion is a result of you kind of being completely into something you're doing. And that's not a given in VR. It's something you have to earn in the design and in the storytelling, right? If you picked up a book and you wake up, or you pick up a book and you look at the clock and you realize, I've got to be at work in two hours, congratulations, immersive media. <laughs> um, so, so you look at things like if you're doing room scale, for example, you have controllers. You can't just grab something and pick it up and use it. You have a controller. The controller is a, is a, is a metaphor for picking up and grabbing something. So as soon as I'm in an experience that's realistic and then I've got to like click a trigger to pick up something, I, I'm immediate, you're breaking the immersion. So don't ask people in your story to do that, right? So it's just thinking about all things you can't do and then what kind of story can you tell that doesn't lean into those limitations and instead turns the fact that you can't do it into a positive. Um, I, I'm coming from a, a fairly particular slice of the AR world in terms of tracking um, digital content in public spaces. Uh, and I want to I, I touch on that in just a second, but let me, let me push back on, on VR for, for one minute and, and just turn, play devil's advocate because I'd like to hear um, the, the response from the other experts on the panel. Uh, when you when you when you when you remove a frame in terms of a storytelling device, uh, the frame allows you to to create this sort of causality, right? The, you're, you're controlling the experience more with with a with a frame as opposed to without a frame. Um, have what are your experiences with spatial audio in terms of a storytelling device or a way to to you know, reframe causality within a narrative environment. I, I think um, spatial audio is, is totally underrated right now in the in, in storytelling. You can you can tell you can use directional sound, um, manipulate uh, you know uh, where where that where it have have a complete story just even with sound with very little visuals. Um, I think that that's possible. Absolutely. It, I mean, it's, that's good, it's absolutely. That's a good point. Yeah, that's crucial. I mean, sound is more, half or more uh, of what's important in, in VR and in, in any immersive experience. Um, the good news is, there's a lot of very smart people uh, and a lot of companies with lots of money that have been <coughs> working on the issue. Uh, I think both the capture technology and the playback technology has has grown by leaps and bounds just in the last two years, um, and it's it's absolutely critical. I mean, what, my favorite experience still to this day, animated. In VR has is if anybody's seen Invasion that was done by Baobab Studios, mm -hmm. and uh, Eric Darnell who directed the Madagascar films and he was he's the, the, the kind of creative mind behind it. He had a very a great story that ties right to your point. And he said and in in the experience you're you know you're out on this frozen lake and you're in nature and um, there's a, you know there's this bunny that you're interacting with and you've got these aliens that come down and there's an eagle flying overhead, and they, they very much, the director wanted to draw your attention to this eagle flying overhead, because you were gonna watch these aliens blow it right out of the sky with a laser, right? And what they realized when, when they were iterating, like I said, we need to iterate to figure out how this is gonna work, is they put kind of the sound at a normal level, and nobody turned and looked at the, at the, at the eagle. And they're like, okay, double the volume. <laughs> yeah. Nope, nobody, you know, because they, they, they have the ability to, they have heat maps so they can tell kind of where you're looking around in the space and nobody was looking. Legal. It turned out they had to turn out the sound to triple the normal ambient sound level. And finally people were like, oh, I'm supposed to look right there so I can catch the plot point of the eagle being blown out of the sky to understand that now I and the bunny are in danger from the aliens. So yeah, it's, it's an absolutely, as important as sound is to, to any medium, it's, it's probably even more important in, in immersive. And, and that's why, you know, they go from, you know, 5.1 to 7.1 in film uh, to 11.1 to, to in VR as a standard. Uh, and I've, I've heard as, as far as 72.1, which is insane, <laughs> but, um, but Bjork did it. And, and that experience was overwhelming <laughs> but she did she mixed she mixed I, I would say I think it was 72 anyway anyway it was uh, it was some uh, an enormous 
uh, mix uh, for this one music video that she put out. Um, was was that for humans? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bjork yeah, is the, on the like reason another. Why she, yeah. The way that she justified it <laughs> is that she had a space about this size, maybe a little bit bigger, um, screens as big as um, you know those panels on both sides, and both of them was playing the same music, but two different vid uh, two different music videos. Um, and, they, and each video was playing off of each other. Um, so you have different sounds from each video um, mixed in. So you can walk from one end to the room to the other. And the speakers were all around uh, above you um, into this entire space. Um, so as you walk, you're hearing different aspects of you know, not just that video, but, but you can hear all channels kind of mixed in the middle. It was. That's great. It was amazing. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I'll say, I, I think it's uh, uh, virtual audio in particular is a lot of fun. Um, aside from being essential, we've actually uh, started, we've done a few projects where we've relied almost entirely on audio and forgotten the video. We did a piece that was connected to Cinemax's Outcast um, that was uh, basically, it would, det it would track when your eyes were open and closed. And when you close your eyes, you would hear the sound of a demon inside you possessing you and you, it would move around and you could kind of place where it was and it's, it's scary and gross and it's just audio um, so at least when your eyes are closed you can't hear it when your eyes are open so but I mean yeah this just there's so much you can do to create a, an immersive world with just audio yeah and let me sort of because I hear like a, a thread so let me pull on this thread a little bit um, and then I can speak anecdotally and, and maybe best practice um, keep it simple and use the, 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 the features of the medium. If, if, they, if they don't apply to the story you're trying to tell, use a different medium. Um, you know, doing this for over a decade now, it's, there's a lot of, been a lot of sort of shiny object moments um, and these hype cycles come and go, but good stories, I think, are, are, are good stories for a reason. So if there's a story that you have uh, that you want to tell, you're interested in this idea, what does VR do for that idea? Right? Are there features of VR that help you tell the story in a way that you couldn't do in another medium, say, just make a video? Uh, same thing with AR. Is there a reason that you want to overlay digital content onto the real world? Uh, does it help you tell a better story? And if so, I think you need to answer that question. Why? Right? Uh, it's, it's perspectival. Right? It's powerful because you're in the space. It's in situ. Uh, that's why we like it. We're not tied to it as a, a technology stack. We're tied to ideas, and this technology has helped us sort of just put these ideas out into the world. Um, that sort of leads me to a, a best practices point, and that, that keep it simple part. We tend to overthink everything. Uh, we had a, a project in Maya at Basel for did, did five murals. This is in 2012, I think. Uh, and we thought, man, we've, we've really thought a lot about these. These are fantastic. The client had an issue with one of the, one of the pieces, uh, and so we had to basically redo it on site within uh, uh, that day because it was being launched. And then that turned out to be the most successful mural of the lot. Uh, paint pouring out of the mural, people got it, it was visceral. Uh, we kept that one simple, not because we wanted to, uh, but because we were forced to. And I, I'm learning that lesson or relearning that lesson in almost every project. So those two things, in some cases, keep it simple. And the other is, is, is there something in particular about this medium that's gonna help you tell this story. If you can't answer that in the affirmative, then maybe it, you need, that's not the medium for you. Uh, Kaylin, would you mm -hmm. just, I'm still gonna bug you to tell that one story about Coco, cool. about the, it was a problem, right? That people came into it and were not looking where you wanted them to, you can't even remember the story. <laughs> like, people were not looking where you wanted them to look. <laughs> okay, I'm going to repeat the whole story. Okay, so, well, because well, we had a we had a bunch of tricks, but but I'm trying to remember yeah, the so what specific was so anecdote. Cool to me is that uh, the person is talking, who had one of the main characters talking. You first come into the experience, but nobody is looking at the person who's talking oh, because yeah. it's a it's a <laughs> world. So they're all looking around like this and not paying attention to the narrator. Yeah. So, so this is an example of using sound. In sort of opposite. Yeah, right? exactly. I mean, to like jumping off of what BC was saying, what what everybody's been iterating on this on this whole panel is like the importance of sound, and uh, yeah, and so spatializing that audio and making sure that people knew which direction to look. But 
just because visuals will still fail you sometimes. I mean, if, if you've been into the Coco VR uh, experience, you will see you start off in this room that's called the Ofrenda, and there's really only one direction to look where there's another human being. And usually our, our eyes are drawn to that. And it, it, it's very well composed. I mean, this is straight from the film. They know what they're doing. Uh, it, I mean, the, the character contrasts with the back of the environment. It's very well lit. It, I mean, for all intents and purposes, you should look that way. But nine times out of 10, people would put the headset on and go, huh? <laughs> Can I go outside where it's dark and cold? And it was the most, the weirdest thing. And so, but by just having the character wait just a second until not, not for the user to look because eventually they will scan the ofrenda where the, where the character is, but then they'll just move right along and start looking at the walls for whatever reason. I, I, I still, it boggles my mind. Um, but just having the main character wait to start their narration a bit, just let the user sort of, I mean, they're, they're in a fantasy world, and you, d we forget because we do it every day. We're probably all like in the top one percent of VRAR users in years, so, so we take it for granted completely. And then you throw somebody in who's never been to the land of the dead, and it's really overwhelming. I mean, you talk about the reason for this medium in particular to tell this story. It's VR takes you to places that are either too expensive or too dangerous or or impossible. And that's exactly what we're doing. And when you start the story right away, they're going to miss the first part of it because they're just c overwhelmed with everything that's happening. So uh, to tie this back into the audio thing, um, we use that spatialized audio to just add these little very, very subtle like knocks and, and ticks and pops and things that are ambient in the direction that we want them to look. And we use that a couple of times throughout the experience. Um, and that on top of really just giving the user a minute to, to soak it all in. I, and I'm wondering, maybe you can, all, all of you can speak to this, uh, that it will change over time as it becomes less novel, right? The, so I, probably. Once, I mean, once people are accustomed to having VR experiences for a variety of... Right, yeah, yeah. I, I used to get kind of nauseous when I get it. I mean, I still, like, one of the first things I prototyped, I was like, uh, we were prototyping for uh, Disney Movies VR, and I thought, hey, when we, when we switch from this land to this land, wouldn't it be great if the whole world just, like, rotated like this? <laughs> <laughs> and I... <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds so innocent now. And uh, so I put it in there, I pressed the button, and I fell down. And then when I got back up, I was like, all right, I'd learned something today. Dear diary. Um, <laughs> that, that's, why, that's why best practices, if you're going to, we always had a rule that if you're going to look at something new in the headset for the first time, you, 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 only, you only got to, you would have to do it sometime between two and four in the afternoon yeah. because because if it, if it if it gave you a driving you know motion sickness headache yeah. we wanted to give you a we wanted to be post lunch and b um, we wanted to make sure that somebody had their camera well no we want to make sure we want to make sure that you had enough time to recover so you could actually drive home oh okay so That's yeah so so best yeah. practice was you know give yourself some time after lunch and before you have to get behind the wheel of a car to check yeah. out you know new aggressive content that's good. Uh, but I mean, now, I mean, fast forward, however long it's been, two and a half, three years, now if I'm in some app where, you know, there's relatively free rotation, I can do that for a while. And so it, it's really just a matter of like building up your resistance. And so, I mean, like when the first first person shooters came out, <laughs> everybody was getting nauseous and now nobody really thinks about it anymore. Or like, so. or like the, you know, the or Blair first, Witch. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> Blair Witch. Um, but also like the first movie, you know, like when people, yeah. people in theater ducking from a train. Yeah, that it's and uh, something that's changing recently, which is breaking the line. Mm -hmm. You know, that used to be a yeah. big deal. It's like, where am I? I don't understand. But now people are like, no, you can break yeah. the line. I still know what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, and not so much the no the nausea effect, but the like the invariant right when people enter stores. Is there a condition response when people enter a VR environment that's knowable? Right. Will that develop over time? Have you have you guys you know have you noticed something that okay there's something that people do consistently when they enter a VR environment that's that's trackable that, well, that can be either right encouraged or discouraged or I'm well, just curious. Like, like you said, well you get you get what's called your VR. We call it your VR legs, like getting your sea legs. And so you you as you 
experience more and more stuff, different and variety of stuff, you do. You get used to, you almost attune yourself to the way the whoever the creator, the storyteller was. You know, you, you're you're you pick up all the subtle cues that. Look, we know all the anarchists can look at their freaking toes through the entire experience if they want to. <laughs> you have to uh, when you work in that immersive environment, you have to give up, you know, total control. You know, that's why a lot. That's why the best VR directors and creators are not film direct, current film directors, right? Because they're used to this mm -hmm. and and curating absolutely everything about that. <clears throat> you know, when you put, when you do this, you have to give up some control. And and the, I think the people that are going to be the most successful and the best stories are the, those who embrace that. That like, look, eight, 70, 80 percent of the people are going to get what I'm trying to pick up, but I have to be okay that 20 percent may not. You know, yeah. and that's just well, that, yeah, that, yeah. that's a question, and I'll kind of pose it to you guys because my background's been almost exclusively AR, so I can't. I mean, I, as a user, I know VR, and obviously with AR Kit, really want to try to understand that because I think that that's maybe a way you end up translating it uh, in some kind of more fixed off kind of way. Um, do you guys feel? I mean, has there anybody? <coughs> try to play the empty space meaning do you feel obligated to lead them through this experience because if it's a world you let them discover the world on their own almost like populate it with so much content that you never would be able to consume it all like there's something happening over here at the same time something's happening over here it's to entirely, cause them to come back it's like the, it's whatever story what is story you're trying to tell i mean i'm just curious like if you guys have you know been able to track or you know with the stuff that you've made if if uh if you've seen people come back like if you give them content that they know they missed have you? I mean, I just don't. I just don't know if an experience personally that sure that, there, that there, story was like that. Yeah, I mean, there, there. If you do a story well enough, you know, in in 360 or or immersive, you you they, it should have it should absolutely have repeat play. Yeah, I mean, you should want to you you would encourage people to come back and try it. You know, let's you know, I, I kind of focused on this throughout. And the truth is, you know, one of the things that we struggled with early on, especially with the Google Spotlight stories four years ago, was. The, you know, all the cinematic language that we were used to when filmmaking out the window, right? Yeah. So uh, this is the direction we, you know, Justin would be like, I, I, want them, I would like them to go this way. I know they can look that way, but I would like them to do this right. way. So we, it was a combination of story and how can we gently move camera to kind of move the story along. Yes, you can look anywhere you want, but this is, so we called it the, the hero view or the privilege view. Of, okay. This is where we'd like you to look. You can right. look anywhere, but this is what we're this is what we're shooting for. Kind right. Of thing. I don't think we're I, I don't think we're there yet in ter in terms of uh, storytelling where it's a repeatable experience. Um, you know, uh, uh, unless you unless we really start to nail down you know branching narratives uh, in a way where people want to have a good enough story so that you can explore. Um, you know, different ways that that story can go. Mm. And uh, interesting enough, um, if you are a game designer, you think more of this way, like what happens when you press that button, you go this way. Uh, and then you play it again, and then it's a completely different experience. And, um, but that's very, you know, evolved storytelling. Um, Does it become a, a game then, I guess? It, it, you know it, I mean, it almost becomes, yeah. and, and oh, that's right. the thing. It's like, it, there's, there's definitely, um, um, when you talk about storytelling in, in, this, in this medium, it could mean so many things. And unless, um, um, and, and so much of that is, you know, um, can you tell a story interactively? Can you tell a story if you do choose your own adventure? Can you tell a story with another character who's interacting with you? Can you experience a story together? But, so, so is it a game, is it not, you know, is it linear, is it not? Um, um, are still, not, yeah. I don't think there's a you know, clear... I, because I, I think branching well. narratives are um, yeah. challenging. I really hate the term, um, and, I, and I hate it because you know, I don't know if Tumblr is still a thing, but if it still exists, there's a Tumblr called You Chose Wrong, and it's just <laughs> it's just the scans of the end pages of Choose Your Own Adventure books that have things like uh, a giant sandworm ate you the end. And like, there's no scenario where that is a satisfying ending to a, any story in existence. That is not a satisfying well, ending. Well, if you grew and up <laughs> eating sandworms, it could be kind of poetic. <laughs> Possibly. Mike, but, um, Mike, I would like you to talk specifically, because I know you can riff on this is choosing the right story. Well, yeah, it is choosing the right story, but I think when you think about branching narratives and you think, okay, are you, are you making a game where people are making material choices, right? Which is a game 
because there's a there's if there's a fail state, it's a game. It, it can tell a story, and you can get a story from it, but it's a game, and you should be following game design principles. I think if you're telling a story, then you've got to think about. I think the, I believe the person in the in the headset and their relationship to the characters, right? So, I think one of the things we learned uh, trial and error is that uh, when we we when we tell branching stories, we actually think about different variables other than like should t telling the character what to do. So we created in one system what we call the trust variable, which is like in this story there were two characters in the story and you, and. The way it would work is that you'd have these interactions with the character, and if the character trusted you, they would change. They would change how they acted in relation to you and in relation to the other person and the other character, and vice versa. So you had an infinite variety of ways the story could go, and it was about your relationship with the characters rather than making material choices. So as a, somebody experiencing it, you always felt like you were in a story, but the story was completely adapting to how whatever choices you made in terms of the relationship of the characters. If you wanted to go uh, gonzo and make them both hate you, uh, the story would go one way. If one of them hated you and the other one trusted you, uh, the story would go a different way. And you can create gradations of, of those variables. But that's where you start to get into, I think, stories as opposed to games, even though you can have multiple outcomes. So I think you really got to get, we really got to get past the idea of branching stories as choices because I think once you ask people to make choices in a story you're you're eliminating you're taking away immersion you're taking away story you're putting them in a different psychological mindset and I think that and to, to segue away from that I think that's exactly where artificial intelligence is going to find its footing inside storytelling yep. right the ability for uh, non-player characters to be able to adapt to what you're doing is going to make for the most immersive of experiences, yeah. right? And so that's what I'm waiting for. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's that's why everybody's so so thrilled about it. So because I mean, as a storytelling device, it, as, as uh, it's going to be fantastic because you're going to have you know essentially infinite variables about what can happen. Um, as a technical tool to help us create the content um, at a higher level of quality and quicker and cheaper, um, you know, our artists will use artificial intelligence to quickly QC what they're doing to iterate quickly it's it's a it's a real game changer in the next mm -hmm. five to ten years everybody's worried that AI is going to replace ours that, that's not going to happen but at least in my in my opinion I think it's what's due is going to give us better tools to actually create with and and be more efficient about it and stories that are created with AI are going to adapt and change and get yeah. better as more people use them which is going to be really remarkable yeah. and and all of that is becoming feasible now right with technology evolving as quickly as it is like we're we're, you know, our, our um, being able to cloud render, our, our processors on, on our phone are faster, uh, everything in the headsets are gonna get faster. Being able to have that data um, uh, back and forth to the to the you know main system so that you can create your own experiences in these in these stories uh, through AI is um, where I can't wait for that to happen. Can I can I, I would share like something, I guess I got personal. Sure. Uh, not an anecdote, but yeah. So I'm, I'm I'm at one time sort of immersed in this world, and another time at other times uh, ready to move to my sheep farm, count sheep, <laughs> kind of be done with it. So l let me just say this in terms of the, the storytelling part of of these technologies. The yeah, AI can open up new, rich new worlds. At some point, maybe we're just creating a canvas and the story plays out on that canvas. Um, but there's something very human about stories, right? We're imaging creatures. We learn as kids through simple stories and parables. There's something to that very simple narrative construct that reaches people on a level that right, nothing else can. Uh, I, I don't have a silver bullet as to what that is in terms of how that silver bullet might run through these various technology stacks. Um, however, uh, we, we draw from a very rich uh, experience with regard to the humanities. And to keep pulling from the humanities and allow that thread to continue through these technologies is the way I think it's powerful. Um, I don't want to see you get lost within this sort of our, our being enamored with these technologies. Again, sort of let me tie it back to a, a, an earlier point, which is 
how can these technologies sort of lend themselves? What features do they offer to help you like keep pulling that thread, right? That narrative thread that you're inter interested in. And BC, do you have any? Uh, it could be impressionistic data on the impact of the art and this experience that you're providing for people, urban settings. What, what's the impact? What what can we learn from this? <laughs> Uh, well, I hate to like. I want to let's just throw like metrics and analytics and everything out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the impact. It's hard to, to tell at this point mm -hmm. because it's still, there's still like a very magical quality about AR. Mm -hmm. Right? People look at this piece, this large public piece that comes to life on their phone. That can, you know, people sort of still do this. Right? It's it has this sort of David Copperfield effect still. So it's hard to know like the, the staying power of it be, as a, as a true storytelling mm -hmm. device. What we think is powerful is the sort of the read-write notion of it that people can input, they can have a dialogue with these spaces as opposed to sort of this consumptive monologue that advertising typically presents. Mm -hmm. It can rewrite mo models of advertising, right? People can have an immediate one-to-one -one relationship with ads. They can choose to opt in or opt out. Mm -hmm. um, this is, is like a reskinning of, of public spaces in a way that it, VR is, is a powerful but absent technology. It pulls you out of the present. For, for what we're, we found interesting about ARs, it pulls you back into the present. Um, it encourages people to go out and interact and, and engage outdoors in public spaces, in city spaces. That's what we find really interesting. This notion of an active citizen that it can precipitate. Um, so I, I don't have a, a great answer in terms of like what are the real sort of social, what's the real social staying power. Let me just tie it up with this. In terms of where it's going, uh, and this may be true with VR too, but this notion of AR in the cloud. So again, the, the city becomes a canvas and the story plays out on that, on that canvas. Mm -hmm. So if you're telling a story in a city, which you kind of can and can't control, uh, the, the information that overlay, with the digital overlay that people see has to be contextual, has to be appropriate to that space. Right? It has to kind of look like it belongs there. Um, it has to be uh, served up in real time. So all this has to be processed in the background in the cloud as opposed to running things on the device. One thing, and just procedurally and technically, that, that AR designers and developers really have to consider is processing in a way that, that VR doesn't. Uh, we spend a, chunk, a huge chunk of our time optimizing, optimizing everything for mobile devices. AR is one of the hardest things you can do processor-wise on a mobile device. I mean, it'll burn this thing up, it gets Bye. hot quickly. <laughs> Uh, these things will get faster and better, and then they'll be on your face, and that brings a whole new set of ethical questions in terms of uh, both bio physiologically and ethically. Um, but that's where it's headed, right? So contextual, serve up information in real time, uh, and then let the user sort of explore that environment uh, and the story can unfold within it. I think the the truism that for us, about, for those of us with the visual effects background, we always, you know, kind of a, an axiom of, we always say that Great CGI cannot save a bad script, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, that, is a, that is a truism that every big budget flop you've ever seen, you know, it was, looks gorgeous eye candy, it can't save it, you know, we like to say we can't save a bad story. And, and the same applies to the immersive media as well. You, you know, you can have the wonderful tech and beautiful visuals and all sorts of stuff, and if the story isn't any good, it's, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna stick with you and it's not gonna be a good experience. So, you know, uh, as my friends at Light Cell VR say, their, their, their motto is story first, and I think it's absolutely, mm -hmm. if, you, if you take nothing else away from this panel, that should be it, is that the story is everything. And everything should be in service of that and not the other way around. And if you have a good story, the opposite of that is true, where, where a lot of the tech and the flaws and things will be forgiven because uh, you, you believe in the, in, the, in the story and the char characters and that experience. Any other nice. best practices before we open it up to questions? A few best practices? Like, Kaylin, I know you have a couple. <laughs> uh, don't rotate the players. <laughs> <laughs> that one already. Yeah. Um, make stuff move. Really, make stuff move. I mean, you could totally forgive the visual fidelity of something, the material of it, if it moves in a, in a lifelike and believable way. This is the exact same thing that Pixar gets away with. Their models, their character models, are extremely low resolution when you, when you compare to you know, lifelike visual effects work out there. Because they know it doesn't matter. What matters is, is connecting with that character, and that character connecting with you is all about the eyes, and it's all about the way they move. 
I mean, Mickey Mouse, you can, you can identify and connect with Mickey Mouse very, very easily, but if he was hyper-realistic, that would be really uncomfortable. It doesn't have to be photoreal to be yeah. in- immersive mm-hmm. and engaging. Hire fewer modelers and more animators, and let's get it going. <laughs> yeah. Any other best practices you want to share? Oh, that was a good one, then. That was a good yeah. one, yeah. <laughs> well, and I do want to bring up social because I know, Kimber, you were talking about that, how important you think that social is to the future. Well, I think it definitely plays, um, you know, that right now in terms of where things are heading, it, I'm, I'm very interested in social VR um, for a lot of aspects, just the connectivity of being able to be any place. Um, <laughs> and I know that a lot of people are developing this. Um, is 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 being able to choose your space and being able to be there with other people whether that be strangers or your friends from anywhere around the world at any time um just like you'd create a chat room a group room you know for to chat with your friends you can do this now all all virtually um and and interactively um how does this work with your poker game so the those are the poker game poker game um for a lot of different reasons i think that uh these developers uh have found a lot of things that worked well um um, the social aspect of it being able to interact with other players um being able to talk to them get to know them um uh you know also also engaging um you know for being able to do high fives with each other or or do hand signals um so um, satisfying buying buying (laughs) uh buying props and like you know gifting things to each other's players you can you can also give them money if you want um um, uh, but just from even from a business standpoint, a business model that, that works um, for for in a purchasing and and being able to do that. But there's something in, really engaging about playing a game socially um, and looking at each other, even though it's in avatar form, um, and being able to engage in that way. And their retention is amazing. Um, on average, every player would play, you know. Two hours um, when they engage on, uh, and then on the weekends, some players would play up to six hours. Uh, that's an amazing thing to be doing in a headset. Yeah, uh, it's mm-hmm. it's Ready Player One type stuff. Those are, <laughs> those are pro numbers right there. <laughs> those yeah. are those are some big numbers, and you know that that is meaningful. That 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 says something. So designing a social story in VR. Mm-hmm. could be super interesting where you're experiencing it with other people and that's right and there and there are more um the the idea that hasn't necessarily been cracked yet but but we're getting there in terms of being able to have group type um plays you know um, like the escape room type stuff or like environmental games where you can explore with your friends uh, a whole vast landscape ride rides together um you know, uh, get points to do things and work as a team to solve a mystery or problem or a game, and um, those are those are really fun to do with your friends. Okay, do do we have any questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah, hi, uh, Matthew. Uh, Patrick. Okay. Well, I, I replay Matt. He could come back. Okay. It's it's okay. Um, on that, on your, uh, movie. If I get it wrong, I'll be mad. <laughs> 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 Exactly. In your, um, okay, so in your in your uh, movie bill app, do people sit there during the, the movie and look at it and use it? They do. What we're seeing primarily is the kind of the the introduction. They're flipping through it. They're getting educated on oh, I can interact with this thing. They interact with a couple of things, uh, but primarily it's happening at dinner after. It's happening the next day. We saw uh, surprisingly a, a bigger spike on Sunday. Well, they're getting it. So, I mean, you're, you're getting it on opening weekend. So, there are certain things that the studio we're working with the studio on from a storytelling that we we can do in the book because we're we're kind of not giving it away, at least in the AR space on the book. Um, but yeah, aside from that, yeah, it, it's really content that you know. There's no spoilers or Is that anything. Something like that. this included with their ticket. Yeah. Okay, and it's only for opening weekend. Yeah, because we, we chip about a million of them. Uh, our, our guaranteed circ is a million, and we had to verify like 98% distribution. So, yeah, so they, weren't right, they run out pretty quick. So then the uh, movie companies, the, the studios, would use that as an incentive to get people there opening weekend and bump up those important Right. Yeah, and Regal is our launch partner. They have exclusivity for a year, and then we'll kind of expand to, to other partners there. But they're our distribution partner. We embedded ourselves in their app because they have – 
you know, over now, actually now over 9 million downloads. So there is some attribution on day one. I mean, we saw a huge spike in new uh, downloads um, and, you know, uh, I can't say the exact percentage, but an enormous percentage of usage of the overall app was, was Movie Bill usage. So there, Regal is extremely happy with it. Okay, so it sounds yeah. like a really cool app. Yeah, it's, it's fun. I'm happy to show you. Uh, the woman in the back. Uh, talking about uh, storytelling regarding character interaction, you know, that's something that I haven't heard to talk a lot. And I don't know if you guys have tried uh, VR um, Blade Runner from Seismic. They do this character interaction. I, I, I'm just, um, it's very it's basic because it's just branching, optional. You answer, you give them a question, they answer, but they seem to react towards you. I had an experience, and this has to do with technicality, that it doesn't recognize my height. So the character seemed to be looking at my boobs, and I was so annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> the whole experience yes. was ruined for me. Even in virtual reality. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was even worse for me. So I just wanted to take on, on, on those kind yeah. of things. It's a technical challenge. I mean, we, we have to, I mean, one of the things that we do, would do when we were visualizing this stuff was trying to figure out ideal camera height. I mean, it's not an easy thing. I, I, you know, what's the... Because you know, if you're six feet tall, or you're five feet tall. So, you know, I, I the, the unsatisfactory answer is that we went with what would work for the majority of people that were going to do the experience. Um, but, you know, it was in this case, it was a, as the Santa sleigh ride experience, right? And we're like, okay, you're going to ride along with Santa. How's that going to work? Well, it turned out the best way to do it for you to really experience the way it was kind of to ride shotgun next to Santa and almost like a sidecar on his. Uh, on his sleigh, and the question was, okay, well, well, we're going to capture this, you know, but how high should the camera be when we're capturing this? And we played with it a lot, and we, you know, it's unfortunately, just some people we knew were not going to have as satisfactory experience. So you try to go uh, with what the majority of people would do. Now, again, moving forward, the technology will get better, and hopefully, these environments will adapt to you again through the use of advanced technology like. Artificial intelligence, machine and, learning. And so I, I blank, I'm blanking on the name of the company right now, but they've been developing, and it's the guys who came from Oculus Story. Um, I'm sorry. Spaces. Spaces. Oh no! Oh, no, 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 no. Oculus no. Story. Um, oh, so they're nice. they're developing um, an AI character in VR that is um, interacting with you on um, a, a multiple different levels. Um, you're in her room. Um, you're playing games with her. Um, she reacts to you. She can be happy, sad, um, um, and and she pulls you into her world in this way. Um, and I think that that um, it, there there's a lot of advancements now using AI in order for them to be able to recognize who who you are, what you look like, and her reacting to you in that way. Well, um, until the trolls from. 4chan get in there and hack it to turn it into a total party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but, but along those lines, a, a question for the panel. When the Google AI came out that can use a voice and make phone calls on your behalf, mm -hmm. and that combined so with sure. the technology to like map somebody's face upon anyone mm -hmm. else's face mm -hmm. to make it look like it's talking to you. Mm -hmm. um, how many years do we have before the Nigerian princes are doing video calls for um, us? Three weeks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> three weeks. <laughs> the, 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 the face on there with slightly bloodied, yeah. and it's it's your partner saying, "I've just been in a car accident." Uh, uh, the hospital needs the the, uh, the technology already exists. Yeah. I just saw a white paper on it yesterday. So let's yeah. <laughs> it's here. <laughs> let's embrace it. So what? So. We have. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on you. No, no, no. That's totally right. fine. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah the, what we have. But but the but the counter argument is is we have AI for good, right? And we have. So it, the irony is is that obviously it's a technology can be used either way. The truth is the best way to counter all the stuff you're talking about is going to be with artificial intelligence that will let us know that this is not real. This is fake, and it'll be an arms race between you know how 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 uh, photo real and how what the fidelity level is of the false image and your AI checker of, yeah, I don't know, we know that this is being generated by a computer and it's not real. And it's hopefully the good guys will win. Hopefully the future of AI is more 
um, Cortana from the Halo games and less Skynet, mm-hmm. but that's that's the that's the challenge yeah. we face, you know, in the coming decades. But that's and, and what's what, but that's what's really important. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. Um, sure. In terms of in terms of all the all the AI and the, ag- and the algorithm that's being created um, in, in in being able to create that, I am so happy to see such a diverse, uh, you know, group here because it's going to be important for all of us to play a role in that uh, to make sure that. Uh, we, you know, we, we help direct what the computers are actually computing. And it's going to be important for us to be actively involved. Mm-hmm. One more question, and then I think we're done. Um, I wanted to go back to when you were talking about making the VR experience of when we could all be with friends or family uh, traipsing through the Amazon rainforest or the Grand Canyon. Do you imagine that as something where we could all be in computers at different points of the world, or is this yeah. something we'd be in the same room? Um, no, no, no. You, you can right now. The social VR experiences are becoming cross-platform, meaning you can be on a Rift on your computer, you can be on Oculus Go, you can be on Gear, and be in the same environment anywhere in the. You can be your at your own houses anywhere in the world with any device um, and have those family vacations together, <laughs> you right. actually could. You, you can sort of experience this, <laughs> the same thing that you're vacations. talking about right now in Coco VR. You are skinned as a skeleton, but you can imagine if you had any other uh, avatar system in place, you could dress yourself as that person uh, and you could present yourself at, you know, to your family and you can exist in whatever environment there is. Uh, it's funny because when we were developing Coco VR, Part of the development was working with Pixar Studios, which is in Emeryville, and Magnopus, which is in downtown LA. So once we set up the social part of it, we were all able to log in to the same environment and see ourselves as skeletons and talk to each other in real time and gesticulate and and, and go like this and nod and do all of these things. It was like video conferencing on crack. It was awesome. (laughs) And it was just like... So you were actually communicating. Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. We've yeah. got tech scouting yeah. tools. We can take pictures. We could take notes. We can do all yes. of these really awesome exactly. things that were that were like very important in in creating this in a way that was familiar for filmmakers. But it's also just like there's a reason why we have those tools and those processes and those methods in filmmaking. It's because they're very efficient and they make a lot of sense and they're very clear. So we just ported those over and and. Everything's Gucci, baby. There's something, there's something to be I? said for making content for VR in a <clears throat> VR environment. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, a, there's a freedom there that, that doesn't exist when you're putting it on paper or in 2D. Yeah. And if, if I can just say one other thing, because I'm, I'm a, a, a producer from a filmmaking uh, point of view, and every time I've seen VR experiences where they're about telling a story or they want us to be somewhere, I haven't been able to make that journey or enter into that world. But when I'm, what was the one where I was at, where I was on the cliff? <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> it blew on my neck and I freaked out. <laughs> it was so real to me. So that, mm-hmm. that kind of VR experience, you know, I think that's really where most of this is, will go, where we can go, you know, do something frightening we wouldn't do in real life. That's correct. You know? yeah. Yeah. I can just jump in on the AR front just real quick. Because you're talking about something communal, right? The, the shared experience. That's been one big knock on AR, that it's it's siloed to a device. We're, we're, we're working on a, a game where one user can leave it behind an AR environment locally for another user to... to to you, yeah, to pick up on. Um, so that that sort of shared community, right, is, is again back to this this notion of humanity, this human touch that I think is important. One thing about ethics, because I, I think I, I've heard it bubble up a few times. There's there's several good initiatives, Open AI, AI for Good. There's another one that I'm involved with with the IEEE called Ethically Aligned Design, um, uh, that that is coming out with a with a paper I think uh, this this fall. So there's some good stuff going on out there on the ethics. I think. Great. And on that note, let's give it up for the panelists. So I'm, I know Magdalena. Oh, cool.